state, we need to ensure that there's a link between financial regulation and the macro economy. If you look back over the last four or five years, you can find any number of warnings from the IMF, from the BIS, and from indeed other central banks about the tensions building up in the system, about asset price bubbles, about risk mispricing, but for some reason there seems to be no link between those warnings and the decisions taken by the regulators. Regulation was done in one corner and macro analysis was done in another. And there's clearly got to be a stronger linkage between the two. And lastly, I would say there is a need for clear leadership in the international financial system. When the crisis hit, you said, well, who's responsible for coordinating a response to it? The answer was, like that. Uh, it was not at all clear. There was a plethora of conferences and discussions and meetings and papers, but no place in which this was effectively coordinated. So those are my five criteria, if you like, for a new architecture, that it must be legitimate, it must match the shape of the markets, it must be able to act faster, it must have a link to the macro economy, and there must be some leadership uh, to ensure that there is a proper uh, coordination. Now, to guide us through this mess, because setting out some clear principles is easy, and working through the detail uh, is much harder, but we are lucky to have with us today three people who are very closely involved and who can give us some useful steers, I'm sure. So we're going to begin with Vice Chairman Wang from the CBRC. I'm afraid that Chairman Yu Min Kang has been summoned to the State Council, uh, but Vice Chairman Wang has uh, stepped in, and that will be no loss uh, to us. I know, uh, because I've worked closely with the CBRC for the last five years as a member of its International Advisory Council, uh, the Vice Chairman Wang is extremely well placed to talk to us this morning. And then after that, we'll have uh, Klaus Regley, um, who was the long-time European Commission, particularly in the, uh, the European dimension uh, of all of this, uh, and then Dean uh, Wei Ying Zhang um, from Beida will finish. So, without any further ado, Vice Chairman Wang, good to you. Bye. 
finance activity are becoming in a global fashion. The financial regulator remains fragmented by jurisdiction and the financial regulation in individual countries is under highly influenced by local political. Thus, that's impeding the consensus of the words and actions of regulators. The current regulatory arrangement has not only lagged behind the rapidly changing market, but also exposed global financial system to high risk. The worldwide South similar to the 1997 Asian financial crisis 10 years ago has emerged again. Yet the current crisis is more severe and the original totally varies. I think the funding crisis this time is on a large extent due to the failure of global regulation, which, which reveals the following with this. No efficient response to the cross-market and cross-border risk content. No true understanding of the risk on a consolidated basis in the large financial institutions which have a systematic influence. No effective situation on highly leveraged institutions such as high bond and investment bank. No sufficient understanding of systematic liquidity issues. Regulators at different countries only measure risk within each jurisdiction at its taste. It is extremely difficult for them to identify and control the systemic risk which is global in nature. Second point I want to impose today is what we have done so far. It is a common recognition that over the past several decades, a number of international financial organizations have emerged, addressing our contribution to global regulation from various perspectives, such as International Monetary Fund, BIS, and the Basel Committee on Banking Situation, Article, IAIS, and the Financial Stability Forum and the Joint Forum, and some regional development banks and all sorts of task force. So far, European Union has stepped further with respect to the regulatory cooperation. The European Parliament, the European Banking Committee, and the Committee of the European Banking Supervisors have been more promoting the convergence of the regulatory standards in Europe. Yet, there are obvious defects with these international and regional committees to name a few follow. Complex structure and fragmented functions. More importantly, lack of enforcement whole, but only serving, but only serving as a platform for discussion. This international organization not mainly dominated by the Western countries. For example, of those 13 policy committee members, there are only 10, 10 are from the European. And excluding some of the very significant emerging markets like the free country, Russia, India, and in China, and Brazil. The third point I want to emphasize is what should we do and what can we do in next? We must take action. In my opinion, the idea of global regulator is not absolutely impossible. Instead, it can be pushed forward to some extent. From the global standpoint, establishing a single regulator is far beyond the current realities. However, for Cooperative perspective, we can improve the existing global regulatory framework so as to make it so as a global regulator. Thus, to achieve our share one, the share one dream of the one world. As far as I stand, a well improved global regulatory framework should at least consist of the following components. Some of some of which we, are, we have already made progress. One, regulators should promote the convergence of the regulatory standards so as to reduce regulatory costs, improve market efficiency, and facilitate level playing playing ball. Some to the efforts made by some international organizations, 
such as the Basel Commission Banking Situation. Some international regulatory standards have been formulated and implemented. For example, Basel II and Solvency II. Two, regulators showed strengthening complications over the issues of the common interests and tried to reach consensus. It is important for regulators from different countries to discuss about the oversight of the hydro fund and rating agencies and about other detailed issues in financial activity, such as information disclosure, digital magazine, code of conduct, and so on. Of course, it is no doubt that big progress has been made in that regard compared with the situation a decade ago. However, we really should have a soft part in mind that there are deficiencies in the global regulatory framework which need to be addressed as soon as possible. 3. Regulators should enhance cross-border cooperation in a bid to strengthen information exchange and policy coordination, as well as put in place cooperative mechanism and early warning actions and cluster management. The current financial crisis reveals that existing cross-border cooperation region is a lack of effectiveness. That is mainly due to the obstacles of information exchange and sharing among different countries. Nowadays, a series of complicated financial products and trading schemes, which are an indispensable part of the modern financial framework, make all, mar make all market participants from different teams now get involved. Therefore, any turbulence taking place in the global market will more or less affect the stability of the individual country. Given this, regulators should, shouldn't confine themselves to the op updated concept if something on state jurisdiction, but with a view to maintain the safe and sound global market, strengthening the cross-border cooperation in real fairness, including enhancing the supervisory cooperation over the cross-border financial institutions that have a significant impact improving regulatory information sharing system, making job efforts to monitor and oversee the cross-border capital flow. Four, regulators should strengthen the systematic risk management from a global perspective. In the context of globalization, comprehensive consideration of a systematic risk monitoring and sampling can only be made on the global platform. So, regulators should work together to make proper arrangements for the purpose of systematic risk management and, more importantly, put the arrangement into practice. Well, some reforms are needed on the global regulatory framework. On the one hand, developed countries should charge more responsibilities that are equal to their financial and economic power, rather than ignoring the voices of, of enhancing cross-border regulation just for the purpose of protecting the local highly leveraged financial institution. On the other hand, it is of wide importance to integrate emerging markets to the global regulatory community. Take China as an example. While China is being exposed to the ever-growing influence of global capital flow, this stability stands significant to the world market. China needs to draw up the good experience of their other countries and at the same time, our good practices are valuable to our foreign counterparts. We should upkeep the function of international organizations. The policy enforcement can be improved through enhanced transparency. Given that it is and and realistic to establish new global organization in the charge of policy enforcement, we can strengthen the function of existing international institutions, <coughs> such as the Basel Committee on Banking Banking Situation and the Financial Stability Forum, and recruit more experts and increase the transparency of policy making and implementation. Since last but not least it is of equal importance for the national regulator to perform their duties. Globalization doesn't and be the function of national supervisors. Each country should in individual to improve its capacity of effective supervision, prevent any risk in the local markets, 
that may stretch to other parts of the world. And Tianjin is a financial city of capacity to withstand external risk. Thank you.
In my view, this crisis did not arise from a failure in coordination. It arose because policymakers and regulators in most advanced countries made similar mistakes. They allowed credit growth and housing booms to get out of control. They did not stop the emergence of the subprime mortgage market. They failed to understand the risks associated with new complex financial products. They did not close quickly enough gaps and loopholes in the regulatory system and allowed regulatory arbitrage to continue. A global regulator would not have prevented the failure of Northern Rock or the problems associated with AIG. And by the way, at the intellectual level, as our David already mentioned, there had been warnings. The BIS, you can read it in their annual reports the last three, four years, also from the IMF. Um, there have been warnings about the excessive buildup of credit and leverage, but nobody um, listened to them. Also, the BIS has no real power to enforce anything. So for me, the message from this crisis is that we need better regulation rather than more institutions. And these better regulations need to be global, and they must be better implemented, and I will return to that. So that's why I think on substance, my answer is such a clear no. Um, the, the global regulator wouldn't have prevented this. In addition, we have all the political arguments, partly indirectly um, mentioned by Pascal and me this morning, that um, reality where power rests within, within the nation state doesn't really allow the national regulator to exist. Because what are regulators supposed to do? We know they are supposed to safeguard the financial system. Um, they enjoy in most countries operational independence in pursuing this objective. But they are ultimately accountable to their government and thus indirectly also to their parliaments. And this is particularly relevant when we get into solvency issues like in this crisis where budgetary resources are needed. There is no global taxpayer. Budgetary resources have to be appropriated by national parliaments. And, um, and there's just no other way. Um, in Europe, we have a particular experience with all this. Because the EU, as you are all aware, is a group of countries where some sovereign powers have been pooled. But we are far away from being one country. We are pushing EU financial integration, and that's why on this issue of how to share a burden if a cross-border bank that is active in several EU member states, if such a situation happens, how to share that burden has been a long-lasting debate over many years, not really been solved so far, except that finance ministers accepted that their meeting in the spring of this year, that it is indeed a common issue if a broader bank if a cross-border bank um, needs budgetary resources, but there's no mechanism in place how this burden would be allocated. It's just one example to show how difficult this is, even in a body like the European Union, where we are very much used to working closely together. But when we get to how to spend taxpayers' money, we are still very much, for understandable reason, at the national um, perspective, because the money has to be approved by parliaments, it has to come from, from the taxpayer in each country. So I think this financial crisis um, has added some momentum to these considerations, also in the EU, because we understand better where the weaknesses are, where we have to strengthen institutional uh, mechanisms. Um, in the EU, for instance, the President of the Commission has just created a high-level expert group chaired by Jacques de la Rousseau, the former head of the IMF, to make proposals in this respect. But back to the global level. So if we don't get a global regulator, and in my view we don't need one, we still need to think about how to make the regulatory and supervisory system better so that we can prevent the next crisis to some extent because we should have no illusion there will be a next crisis but it's still the task of the governments to 
um, reduce the frequency of prices and its debts. Um, the key issues that need to be addressed, and, and some of that you have heard already, so I can be short. I think the existing regulatory framework needs to be made more comprehensive. The gaps that have been clearly identified in this crisis um, need, to be, need to be closed. And this relates to the things I mentioned, um, doing something on derivatives, where the New York Fed came out with a proposal already um, last year. The European Commission is going to make proposals in this direction. We need enhanced cooperation among national regulators, um, particularly with respect to information flow, because it's shocking for people like myself who are not regulators when we found out um, how little information flow there was before the crisis. Even between regulators where one would think that they had a certain affinity in London and New York, but also the need to, to, do, to work a lot together because many of the international banks are active in the London market and in the New York market. Um, that needs to be improved, and I guess it probably has improved over the last few months, but it was far from perfect. We need also increased convergence among national regulatory regimes. I know that our chairman, Howard Davis, doesn't like the term convergence, he prefers the term equivalence, um, but um, that's a detail you have to read, it's a very interesting book to understand those, those details. I think we need higher capital requirements for banks, um, we need more attention to liquidity supervision. We also need greater consistency in the regulation of the financial sector overall with its different components, banks, insurances, securities houses, because they are more and more integrated and we want to limit regulatory arbitrage also in that area. We also need greater consistency between the financial regulator on the one hand and other relevant frameworks, notably in accounting. And I've already mentioned fair value accounting as one factor contributing to the problems. And finally, we need an enhanced interaction between those bodies that are in charge of the macro potential side, and how David mentioned that, very important on you. So those in charge of macro, central banks, <coughs> the international financial institutions, need to interact more with the regulators who very often have only taken the micro potential view when they regulate um, the banks. So these are some of the directions in which I think the regulatory system should move. But um, one point is also close to my heart, and it's not much discussed. I think it's also important, looking again at the origins of this crisis, that macroeconomic policy making gets better, because it has contributed to this crisis. Monetary policy and also the fiscal policy has been too pro-cyclical, and that should not be forgotten with all the firefighting and reforms of regulations, which are very important, but to prevent the next crisis also, the macroeconomic policy side should be um, analyzed and be made more robust. Do we need institutional changes? I said no single regulator, but I do think we need some changes. I don't think we need new institutions, and I know this is controversial. Um, I don't think we need a new Bretton Woods. We need probably a few more powers or a different focus of IMF work. The IMF should focus more on the spillovers between the financial sector, the financial issues and the real economy. They are doing that. They have just created a new division within the IMF to do exactly that. We should also look at more at these macro prudential um, issues. But beyond that, the IMF, one has to recognize, is only as strong as its members allow. For instance, the IMF was among those, as our data said, that warned about the crisis. And they warned very specifically, for instance, the United Kingdom repeatedly about the credit growth and the housing um, developments, but the government decided not to listen. So in my view, no need for new revenue. Um, but of course, I would never object, um, particularly if my president Barroso says he wants to have a special G8 meeting, an enlarged G8 meeting, to look at the international financial architecture. I think that is necessarily useful. They should look at 
more than their view, the lessons are from the crisis where we need to reform the regulatory supervisory system. And I very much in this context would favor what um, Bob Zellig calls the steering group of the international financial system. He made a speech two weeks ago and he argued that the steering group for the system is needed because otherwise you don't have efficiency, you don't have quick decision making. You cannot have a UN system where everybody has one voice, one vote. You need a smaller group. It used to be the G7. Um, I don't consider that to be any longer the appropriate body. Um, here, if I'm allowed to be radical because I'm now a semi-academic at the value school, I would dissolve the G7, um, create a G4 group for exchange rate issues, that would be the US, the Euro area, Japan and China. And actually this is not so utopian as it may sound because de facto this is happening. Um, behind the scenes without much publicity and that's good that way. There has this G4 been active at the deputy level um, over the last six months. For all the other issues that um, G7, G8 used to discuss over the last few years, we should have a wider group. It could be 12 countries, it could be 14. Um, several proposals have been made. It would certainly include China and India, um, certainly Brazil, probably fairly certainly South Africa, perhaps African countries that would make it 12. Um, there will be endless arguments whether Saudi Arabia and, and Egypt should be there. But it must certainly be larger than the present G7, G8. And I think if we have a steering group with that composition, it would change a lot of things in the other institutions without creating a new one. Because it would change the dynamics in the IMF. Because the G7 as a steering group determined to a very large extent what happened in the IMF in the 90s. I was there, these were G7 decisions and others followed. It will also um, um, become very important for the Financial Stability Forum, which has become de facto the key body in coordinating the global regulatory and supervisory system. The Financial Stability Forum was really created to make the G7 more effective. And then later on, a few countries were added, like um, Singapore, Netherlands, Switzerland but still mainly a G7 body, because from each of the G7 countries there are three persons in the delegation, the central bank, the deputy governor, the deputy minister of finance and the head of the supervisory agency. The other observers, so then they come only with one person. If the steering group, the new steering group of 12 or so were to replace the G7, it should also be reflected in the financial facility forum. It should also be reflected in the Bar Committee of Banking Supervisors that our data mentioned, where a lot of this important work is being done. Now as a European, you will probably have one question, why does Europe not make it all much easier to only show up with one delegation? Um, that would shrink, obviously, the number of people in the room. I would be very much in favor of that, the European Commission is in favor of that. It will not happen the next few years, I have to disappoint you. But I'm sure one day um, it will happen. I'm sure we will have one day also the supervisor at the EU level for the big cross-border banks, which are only 30 or 40, the other 8,000 banks can still be supervised nationally. But for the cross-border banks, a small group, there will be a European supervisor in a decade or so. And I think one day there will also be a European delegation in all these international bodies, which will make from the efficiency perspective one of the five criteria will like for everybody easier. But again, it will take a number of years. Don't criticize Europe too much. After all, Asia is also not integrating as quickly as some had hoped. There's no talk about Asia showing up with one delegation at any of these meetings. So I think the EU is ahead of it, but don't expect miracles. Thank you very much.
we are just uh, like to emphasize uh, uh, three points. First, about the uh, uh, origin or causes of this uh, financial crisis. I quite agree with the uh, uh, clause that is that uh, I think maybe technology, uh, uh, technology is a very, very important reason for this uh, uh, financial crisis. In film uh, history, you know, uh, sometimes uh, technology innovation uh, is a faster than institutional you know, uh, uh, innovation. I think this time is uh, uh, very true uh, in this case. Uh, with the help of uh, powerful computers, uh, there are a lot of new financial instruments developed. Uh, direct, first derivative, then derivative of derivative, then derivative of derivative of derivative. So with, the, with the so long change, it's really difficult for uh, people, even in those very, very intelligent people in financial, uh, in financial sector, to see what is uh, fundamental. So I think that is uh, uh, really uh, create a big trouble for people to work uh, on this uh, 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 new new situation, but I thought that greatly uh, we will we will, be, will be able to develop some new uh, institutional uh, innovations to handle this problem. I mean, it's a financial innovation is a very very good uh, for efficiency of capital and also good for. Uh, risk sharing. Uh, probably the, how could we develop a new uh, policy, new institutions to handle this problem? Uh, let me give you an uh, analogy, like uh, when the first person invented the plane, you know, it's always a crash, a several crash. Uh, that does not mean we, we should stop this innovation. What we need to do is to improve this innovation, and this is the same for uh, our financial innovation. And some people say this uh, crisis is a market failure, but I, I do not, not think that's market failure, but that might be just the way of how market works. Uh, market always like this, yeah, uh, evolve through some uh, crisis uh, mistakes. And also I like to emphasize uh, uh, if we want to believe uh, Probably, I think the government should be blamed. That is, uh, as uh, Cross mentioned, that is uh, too many uh, liquidity uh, inject in the uh, uh, market and uh, keep uh, interest rate too low. So that the house market, uh, create a house market bubble. And that is uh, a very, very important reason for all other uh, optimistic, uh, uh, which should not be like that. Uh, this is uh, the uh, first point I'd like to mention. Second is uh, I also uh, do not agree that uh, to have uh, some like global financial regulator. And uh, I think the very, very important to have uh, competition and diversity of uh, institutions. Uh, you know, all its uh, efficient institutions has been involving through competition between different uh, uh, competitive uh, institutions. If we have just one regulator, it's very difficult to have a good innovation. There, because there's, when there's no competition, there's a, it's hard to measure which uh, policy, uh, which regulation is more efficient. And I also think that it's really politically is, uh, impossible. And uh, also, it's uh, very hard to regulate uh, regulator. And I think even within a country, it's difficult to do that. If uh, we do that in, uh, internationally, I think it's uh, more difficult. Uh, this is, uh, you know, that we, uh, uh, if we have a, a, a international uh, finance regulator, it will create a big political uh, game, and uh, uh, because many countries have uh, different uh, interests, their own interests, and uh, it's a very difficult to coordinate. 
and you both know. So, first of all, China shows participating in the global financial uh, forum and standard setting bodies. And secondly, and China shows ready for participating and as soon as possible. I think that China has uh, accumulated some experience in the past 30 years in the refinery reform and open up. And also we have accomplished a big economic power. We can play some role in, in keeping the global financial stability. Thank you. I think that's a very important answer, by the way, to say so. Um, Klaus, let me press you a little bit on the European dimension of this. Although you may say that just in the last few days, some consensus approach has emerged in Europe. Uh, for some time, it was a shambles. Uh, we had countries following uh, beggar my neighbor policies on deposit guarantees. We had cross-border banks having to be restructured over a weekend in very uh, confusing ways. Um, and you tell us that a single European regulator would be a jolly good thing. You agreed with me that we needed mechanisms faster, and then you say we have to wait for 10 years. Why? Why do we have to wait 10 years for a regulator if you think we need one? Well, one, the system has proven to respond to prices in an ad hoc um, So we do have a good framework of operation now. So for the prices, we don't need to regulate them. As a bureaucrat, bureaucrat, which I've been all my life, of course, I want to have a system in place that yields in the future. That's also very much the European approach to create a good space system.
But uh, how do you deal with the point that in some cases this regulatory competition uh, does not seem to be delivering better regulation, it just seems to be delivering less regulation in the sense that uh, there is a race for institutions to move uh, to the most congenial regulatory environment, the most particular example of that being uh, in offshore centres. So most large hedge funds are actually domiciled in places like the Cayman Islands, um, where the rules on transparency and disclosure are much less strict. So doesn't your argument for regulatory competition in fact create precisely the problems that we're now trying to deal with? of a system which it lacks coordination and where there are great gaps in the global uh, regulatory architecture. I think I'll give it back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'll give a very acknowledged for uh, regulation and good indicators. So it's a uh, part of some people know better than the other. And if we have just one regulation, and if we stay with them, that, that would be the last. If you have many uh, regulators, then the issue of the regulator will try to some uh, uh, best uh, uh, rules. And then uh, they can see, we can say, this is the most effective uh, Let me say something like a uh, 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 corporate uh, law in Mars. So there are so uh, little space. Uh, usually they are all corporate law. So that is the Thank you. My name is Harman Panacheri. I am the ex-board member of the Central Bank of Egypt. Um, uh, at the moment, I'm in public. Uh, I have very brief comments. First of all, um, the points raised by uh, Mr. Klaus are very essential. 
I think the issue that or issues that we are facing now goes substantially deeper than the issue of regulation. I beg to disagree that and even enhancing that targeting regulation would not prevent similar crises. Uh, I think the basic question comes here that should we find a way that to make the financial economy more linked directly with the real economy? Whether it's a question of coordination, whether it's a question of uh, redesigning architecture in the system to make it a bit difficult, if not impossible, to develop in such an innovative way that makes such a discrepancy between the real world and the financial world. And one of the things I think that fell into this, and that's probably relates to the first session when you talked about globalization and reaching to our pockets. Uh, is it not true that one of the reasons of the spread of the crisis, particularly in the third world country, is that we have been pushed by all international organizations, by all donating agencies, that was a condition that you have to regulate, you have to introduce, you have to introduce innovative techniques, you have to introduce innovative products, otherwise you are not part of the global economy. I think there is two dimensions to the issue. One is that really it's a chance to look substantially deeper into the financial system. The other one is to re-question the extent to which globalization, that at least in financial markets, concept-wise, value-wise, and stages. Is it incremental or do we have all of us to join the same boat with the same projects that have been warned against by so many uh, third world countries in addition to distinguished countries years ago? That's why it should be to a disaster. But forget it. You don't know, you are backward, you are not innovative. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, could you uh, comment on the steps that have been taken in recent weeks by governments? Uh, are they on the right track? And uh, also, from a longer term point of view, are they um, sowing the seeds for further problems or not? Yeah, uh, Li Xiaobo from Columbia University. I, my question is directed to uh, Chinese uh, uh, panelists here. Uh, and we know that the long-term effect of uh, this current uh, financial crisis is still being debated, uh, particularly on the role of government, regulation, market structure, you know, the, the, whether there should be a global integrated regulator or not. But specifically on China, what do you think at this point? I know you're still being probably thinking of this issue, how this affect China. But how do you look at China? Professor Zhang, I know you were one of the advocates of uh, uh, financial reform for a long time. So given this current crisis, I know with a lot of on the streets, you know, at the street level, Chinese have been bewildered by this whole new crisis in the, on Wall Street. You know, we know that back in China 10 years ago, they, uh, not less than 10 years ago, they tried to reduce the state share in the market and in, in the stock market. The now that the states now they're reversed. How to increase the state share in the stock market and how that you know. So what kind of a what we're going to discuss values or, or ideology maybe a little bit, but doctrine-wise, anything that's this this could be a of a, a lesson of something. Thanks. Right. So, yeah. Go back. I'm Zhou Dongqiang from China Banking Regulatory Commission, which is under the leadership of Mr. Wang. And I work with uh, Chairman Wang. I have a question for Mr. Davis. Uh, <coughs> is a global financial regulator in my view, I mean, impossible uh, for most people at present stage. So, uh, global, regulator, <laughs> global regulatory corporation is a necessary, important, and urgent and to assure that. The kind of uh, financial regulatory cooperation must be timely, effective, and uh, proud of the whole So, uh, what kind of mechanism can we develop to assure this kind of uh, world financial 
corporation. Thank you. Thank you. Any more? I'm not sure that. Yeah, one more down there, and then we'll get the panel to respond. I'm from the Kutuzovac University, Mehra. And uh, about this financial crisis, as you know, in Japan we have a good or bad example of how we dealt with. And uh, it's really uh, interesting to see the same kind of panic situation is going around in the world. Uh, and uh, my simple uh, feeling is that people don't really know the rest. We've heard a lot from the US at that time why the Japanese regulator didn't do anything about these no proponents or things. It took about 10, 15 years. And that had some reason, I think, why it took so long. What I just want to say is one comment. And maybe one question for me. One comment is what we ended up after this financial crisis was uh, two things we found out. Very simple. As Klaus said, it's basically who's going to pick the top, the final burden sharing. And it's going to be a national taxpayer. So basically, it's a political issue how we're going to deal with financial crisis. And that means a strong political leadership from the top is very necessary. So in Japan now, in 2001, we set it up. Prime Minister is going to summon a financial emergency council with the members of the finance minister or the cabinet secretary or the bank governor or the head of the supervisory agency. So the Prime Minister is going to say, okay, this is a financial crisis and systemic implication is so important that we have to put money in somehow. And there are two things, whether the financial institution is solvent or insolvent. If it's solvent, that means it can survive, then you can do probably inject capital as the U.S. also did, and the European did, everybody's rushing to do it. The second is, if it's insolvent, you can nationalize temporarily, just uh, take it away, or you can survive. Somehow you can do by owning uh, the nationalization process. There's two types, whether it's banks, solvent, or insolvent. So this is my comment, because we set it up a framework. It seems to be working. This time we haven't got burned for whatever reason. Um, the second thing is about the leadership. I read the Financial Times the other day. It's particularly for the Howard Davis. The question is, okay, Gordon Brown seems to be pulling a very strong leadership this time, uh, according to the newspaper. I don't know really. But according to this editorial, this global leadership doesn't buy votes for him. So he's facing a very difficult domestic political situation. Because people in Britain will not probably value so much of his superhero type of activity in this financial crisis, which will not be counted as a credit to him in his political domestic sort of scene. So, how do you respond to that if you're going to talk about a strong political leadership? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, let me try and organize those questions um, a little bit so that uh, uh, each of our panelists can lead on, on one of them. Um, and let me begin uh, with my seven plans. This question of regional cooperation. That was the first question. What importance do you attach and what prospects do you see for greater regional coordination between regulators and independents? <laughs> I think the, the funny part is uh, five and ten years ago, and the current part of the in the United States and Europe provides very good opportunity for the different countries to enhance their competition. This is respect of the regional and the global one. I think under the current funding process, it's necessary for the Asian countries our regional group, such as uh, 10 plus 3, I think it's necessary and uh, very important for these Asian countries to enhance their cooperation and to deal with the current uh, crisis, how to uh, take the effective measures to deal with the crisis uh, contingent right from the United States to Asian countries and how to take the rough policy and, uh, and actions to keep 
the regional financial economics previously. And uh, I think maybe uh, in some time, it is necessary for the Asian countries to establish an emergency or uh, the crisis uh, rescue fund. And different country can make contribution to that fund. And if some individual countries suffer the liquidity crisis, I think they can get fund money from that fund. And also, we should greatly improve the, the efficiency of the information sharing and the policy consistency. And we should learn some practice and experience from European countries and to establish very good, very efficient mechanism in which the country can get policy consensus and can get the action, the coordination. Thank you. Now, Klaus, let me, can I ask you to pick up a, a couple of the um, questions, really? One is the question from uh, Egypt or Qatar, no. <laughs> um, about uh, the connection between the real and the financial uh, economy, and in a sense, has that become too, too separate? And also, uh, perhaps I could ask you to pick up the question as to whether you think the steps taken so far by governments uh, are broadly correct. That's the Australian question, yes. Well, it's a question. Um, yeah, everybody's unhappy about uh, this disconnect between the real economy and financial market. To some extent... So this disconnect real economy, financial markets. To some extent, I think we have to find a system how to live with it. Because when you look at the size of the financial market today, with 50 years ago, in relation to the real economy, it's much, much bigger. Um, there are different definitions how you define financial assets, but um, one definition says that financial assets in the world today add up to 500% of world GDP. 40 years ago, they were 100% of GDP. That has implications for many things. Um, and you can call it disconnect, but this will not go away. And as the world continues to save, to have a savings rate that's higher than nominal GDP growth, and that's the case in all countries except the US probably, um, the financial markets will continue to grow faster than the real economy, and therefore this disconnect will continue. I think this has important implications for our policy frameworks, which have not been well recognized. I mentioned very briefly early on that I think one lesson from this crisis should be to create more robust economic policy frameworks on the monetary policy side. In my view, it's not enough to focus on inflation targeting. This is very controversial, I know, but um, I think this crisis at least tells us that we have to reconsider. Also on the fiscal policy side, fiscal policy has also been too, has been too procyclical. We need much more of the macro potential um, analysis, but what that's the point, everyone agrees on that one. Um, and if we make progress in this area, then we may be able to manage this disconnect, because um, we will continue to have to live with a situation where financial markets grow faster than the real economy. Um, you also asked, if I may answer that question, whether everybody has been pushed by the IMF, the G7, to open up, to innovate, to deregulate. Um, I think this is not the quite correct analysis. Um, and I would want to draw the conclusion that deregulation in general is bad for the economy, and innovation would be bad, and opening up. Um, I think, in general, for the economy, all this is helpful and must continue. There's a one area on capital market liberalization and opening up, where indeed, for a while, the IMF and the G7 pushed the rest of the world to move very fast. But this ended with the Asian crisis. The peak of that was really the annual meeting of the IMF in Hong Kong in 1997. Um, and after that, this has become much more nuanced. And there's no general recommendation from the IMF or the Washington Consensus to deregulate immediately and open up immediately the capital account. 
Um, and I think that's the, the right way. On the Australian question, um, to assess the recent steps and to say whether this is moving us on the right track. I think given the seriousness of the situation, given that this crisis is probably once in a lifetime, hopefully, um, there was no choice. A lot of public money has to be used in different ways depending on the circumstances in each country. Some countries um, are more in favor of recapitalizing banks, others nationalized immediately. The US for a while wanted to buy toxic assets, now they also decide to use some of the money for recapitalization. There are these different possibilities, probably in most countries, um, all these instruments have to be used one way or another. They all used money initially, not necessarily in the long run. We have seen other crises where a lot of public money was needed initially and later on it was all recovered. So this is, I think, unavoidable um, and must be done. And then we need to change and improve the regulatory system and all the other things that we have been discussing about. To address the risk of moral hazard, which indeed is there, and um, I think you alluded to that, um, we should also not forget what I mentioned earlier. We have to draw the right lessons for monetary policy and fiscal policy. The economic policy management framework has to become more robust. And um, this means that the liquidity that has been pumped into the system rightly now must be withdrawn faster, as fast as possible once this crisis is over. I think we learned, and central banks learned the lesson from the crisis in the 30s, to be very generous with liquidity creation when the crisis gets its bad. This is the right lesson. We should also learn the lesson from, for instance, early this decade, when after the bursting of the equity bubble, a lot of liquidity was created. But it took central banks too long to mop up and destroy all this liquidity. Interest rate level in the US, in my view, was too long at 1%. Um, also, in my view, and I don't want to blame only the Federal Reserve, also in Japan, interest rates have been now for a decade at half a percent, despite the fact that Japan had several years of potential growth. Also, the fact that China and the Gulf countries pack their monetary policy to a weak currency that has, at the moment, for good reasons, a very loose policy, which these countries that have booming economies import. This also adds to global liquidity. I think all that must be reconsidered to avoid the negative consequences of the firefighting that's unavoidable at the moment to show up in additional problems in the future. Thank you. Now, there were, there were two questions for me, which I regard as rather unfair, if you're the chairman, okay, you're the, the writer supposed to be asked our people questions. But I will, I will answer that, but before I do, um, the, uh, Jack, could you answer the question from Columbia um, about the, the, the politics of market intervention, if you like? Has this now changed in China's attitude towards state involvement in the stock market in the financial system? Yeah, I, I think uh, some uh, Chinese people are taking off. Uh, you know, the distracted Georgian market failure, mm -hmm. so that China should not uh, take a too pro market approach. And uh, rather, that's not my idea. The state ownership banks can avoid the financial crisis, but it will create big economic crisis, even disaster. That was the Chinese history show in the past. Uh, your decades. You know, before reform, there was no financial crisis. And uh, but there was a big uh, economic problem. Economic couldn't develop it. Well, uh, people couldn't handle the right. And now the, the same, I think. Uh, I hope this West uh, developed country to take ownership of bank as a temporary, not a permanent. And they, when this crisis uh, and they show uh, sell this uh, shares to public, not to continue to hold that, and that's important. And related to this, I think I also like to emphasize: we talk too much about uh, regulation, little about reputation. In market, I think reputation is more important than regulation. Uh, than regulation. In some cases, 
regulation act that damage your reputation. That if you are regulated too much, uh, banks and other private institutions will have no incentive to build their reputation. Now, that is what uh, and also sort of China, when all banks are protected by government, no household uh, deposit care where money should deposit. There's no bank care of their uh, care for their reputation. And certainly in the market there's also other problems. You have an incentive to build reputation, good reputation. But you may have no good uh, cap capability to build reputation. That's the problem. And but I, I, I think we need to balance this. Yeah, sometimes we, we have a regula uh, regulation which can help for can be helpful for for building reputation. Particularly when you make like a uh, evasion more transparent. Yeah. But if government take ownership, that is uh, give a guarantee, everything, that will totally destroy the incentive to build reputation. I think so, so if we look at the long run, I think it's a market. Market developed reputation would be guaranteed to for good future, not down the regulation. Thank you. Well, let me conclude then by dealing with the two questions uh, for me and I. The, the last question from CDRC is a good opportunity to, to sum up, I think. Um, but first of all, the question about uh, Gordon Brown. Um, yes, uh, it seems that um, about uh, 10 days ago, uh, Gordon Brown did stumble on a policy formulation which appears to have been so far reasonably successful and to have been copied elsewhere. Um, it, this uh, took about 12 months, and I was reminded of the famous Churchill quote about the Americans, which is that you can always rely on the Americans to do the right thing once they have exhausted all possible alternatives. <laughs> and um, this was rather how uh, Gordon Brown got to his policy, I think. Um, as for the uh, domestic implications of it, well, actually, there was an opinion poll at the weekend which showed that it had produced a an increase in his poll ratings for the Conservatives. Uh, curiously, uh, the poll showed that of the three parties, the Liberal Democrats lost five points in the polls from 20 to 15, and Labour went up four and Conservatives went up four. And some of those who observed this particular crisis and the, and the policies on it would, uh, I think, be bound to comment that actually, objectively, the Liberal Democrats have said more sensible things and have generally forecast ahead what the government would have to do. And the prize for them is to fall in the polls um, because the government has actually done what they recommended. It's rather curious. But it does appear that it has had a positive effect on his political standing. But I would caution that Gordon Brown um, is, a, is like a very volatile stock. Um, he's like a kind of Chinese high-tech company. I mean, in the first six months, he was um, absolutely dominant, uh, way up in the polls. For the next 12 months, he had the lowest poll ratings of any British Prime Minister since time began, and now suddenly he's gone back uh, up again. So uh, buying shares in Gordon Brown is only for the wealthy and very risk-seeking investors, uh, in my view. The last question from the CBRC was about um, if <clears throat> there is no prospect of a, a global financial regulator in the sense of the CDRC or the FSA, which I think I would accept, then what do you nonetheless do to achieve more coordination and convergence and everything? Now, I think my uh, solution to that um, would be a combination of what uh, Klaus said, um, but also something that I recommended in my book earlier this year. I think that, as he said, there needs to be a G-something which more reflects the shape of the financial sector. Possibly there needs to be some uh, finance, finance minister subcommittee of, of, of the head of government, but which really has the task of driving reform and achieving coordination and coordination. I think personally the best mechanism for that 
would be a reformed financial stability forum. I would call it a financial stability council to give a signal that it actually had some ability to coordinate others' activities, and it would be responsible for these linkages between the macro economic analysis and the regulation, and would have some ability to direct the regulatory groupings underneath it. Uh, now, that, that's delicately delicate to achieve, uh, but I think it is the best place for greater coordination to be pushed forward, particularly if it can be reformed to include uh, China and other important countries. Uh, so that would be my favourite uh, solution. It would not be a new institution in that sense. I think it would need a stronger secretariat. It could build on the DIS uh, for that. Um, and the other groupings need to accept that the, that council would give them their marching orders. I mean, not in the sense of telling them precisely what capital ratio there should be for each bank, but you know, telling them that this needs to be reformed quickly, and it means they need to come back in six months for the reform and not wait for another decade. So at the moment, there's no discipline on these international bodies, actually. So that's roughly where I would go. Thank you very much for your questions and contributions from the floor, which I think pointed up the issues very effectively. And on your behalf, thank you very much to the three panelists, uh, Vice Chairman Wang, who was very kind of you to step in at short notice and give us a very clear view of China's policies in this area, which I think are changing in interesting ways. Uh, thank you very much to Klaus Regin for being both an academic uh, and a Eurocrat. Uh, we don't call them Eurocrats, we call them Eurocrats, uh, where we come from it's slightly more abusive uh, term. Um, and also to Dean Zhang for some uh, reminding